Boston Pizza, all the good stuff. Um, but let's continue. So part of this improving JavaScript, I'm going to go through a few tools that I use that sort of, I think, benefit my process. So those things can do things like keeping it clean. Keeping it clean is important because clean code can be readable. Like if you look in the background here, this is artificially terrible code, but it's hard to tell what's going on. It's hard to sort of dive in and be, I know what's going on here, and I, if I, there's a bug, I can figure out what would be causing it. So clean code's important there. Having a set standard of style also can be really beneficial for making it easy for people to jump in and out while keeping consistent code that just looks nice and reads nice and is maintainable. Uh, dry is a pretty common expression in coding. It means don't repeat yourself. I added the O there because I'm going to be talking a little bit about including other people's code in your work, using libraries. Basically, making sure your code doesn't have a lot of redundancy in it. The more redundancy you have in your code, the more likely you are to run into issues where maybe something's broken in one tiny place, even though you're repeating this one piece of logic so several times in your code. It, there's more places for errors to be. So breaking things down to small repeatable modules and also using external code that um, other people have solved problems for you saves you time and also reduces chance for errors there. And to keep it moving forward. So keep using new technologies, trying new things and experimenting to sort of push things forward always and uh, just lead to a more modern web. So the first uh, tool I'm going to be talking about today is called ESLint. ESLint is a code linting tool, which basically means it can read through your code and tell you, and sort of pick out points that could be common errors. It can uh, like ch see styles and make sure that based on the style set you, you give it, you follow very strict styles. Um, the nice thing about ESLint is how pluggable it is. It's got a very full feature configuration so that basically any sort of rules you want to set up, you can to make sure your code fits exactly the style you're looking for. Um, so I'm going to do a quick little demo of using ESLint. Uh, I've got over here some code right here. So I've got a few code I'm going to be working with. Um, and I'm going to use this section first. And so right now it's nicely formatted, but I'm going to throw a few little bugs in there just for demonstration. So if you know the WordPress coding standards, you know you want to have space between parentheses, I'm going to throw some legitimate bugs in there, like having a, a semicolon there when that should be a comma for continuing this fair statement. Um, let's just mess up a few other things. OK, so we've got some bugs. We've got some style issues. So I'm going to go back to the command line, which is over here, and run ESLint. So I'm using Grunt to run it, but you can also run it just as a CLI thing. It has also gulp extensions. Basically, however you want to run it, you can make it work. Um, so I'm just going to run my little ESLint task here. Is that big enough? I can make that bigger. That's better. So when that runs, it sort of reads through my files. And that's, oh, did I not save the file? Yeah, OK. So it reads through the file and finds any issues with it. So we've got one issue first, parsing error, unexpected token. So that's from the most serious bug I added from not having the closing parentheses there. So immediately we know there's a bug here. We don't have to go to the browser. We don't have to get anywhere. It just tells us there's an issue with your code. Right again, and we should be getting a ton of issues now. So these are all the different style issues that don't even that don't necessarily break code immediately, but seem like they could be an issue down the line. We've got things like um, this weird error, which is actually from that extra semicolon. There needs to be spaces, except all sorts of different things there. And as you read through them, you can go back in here and see, oh, we're missing a space there. Oh, this is a semicolon, and that should be a comma. Um, I think that might be the things that were causing those errors. Let's see. There's still one missing space on line 15, column 23. So line 15, missing space right there. Oops. OK, there we go. Um, so now we just get that one error, and it says unexpected constant statement. That's because my current rule set my current rule set doesn't allow consoles, but it's a warning instead of an error. So it doesn't break anything. But I just generally want to say, warn me so that I know when I'm pushing code to production, it doesn't log things to the console. It also doesn't allow debugger statements. Um, if I go back to my code here, I can actually open up my configuration file. It's over here, which has a lot of rules in it. It probably could be pared down a bit. It's sort of trying to emulate the WordPress coding standards. 
with a few additions here. So we've got something that says we uh, have the browser. We're in the browser, so we want to allow things like window and document as global variables. We want jQuery because we're frequently going to be uh, requiring that as part of our WP and Q statement. We're using common JS, which I'll get into in a little bit. Um, and then we also have all these rules which sort of set style and allowed things. And there are a lot of ESNet rules. So I'm overwhelming to look at right here. But um, basically, each one sort of determines if it's an error, if it's a warning, if we should just ignore it, special cases, like we can set more specific things. <coughs> Excuse me. Um, so this is sort of a quick little uh, configuration file I set up to try to emulate that WordPress coding standards for JavaScript. I'm sure there's some issues with it. I'm still sort of working on it. It's a living, working thing. But it allows me to always make sure that my code matches the standards. So it's cool. And it's fast, and it easily lets you know where issues might be in your code. Um, so that's using ESLint. Next up, we have Browserify. Browserify is a tool that a lot, helps a lot with the don't repeat yourself section and also with others. So basically what Browserify does is it helps you, it allows you to sort of connect JavaScript files together, both within your own local files and with external libraries. It implements common JS, which is a system used by Node to um, connect files together. Um, it's, that sort of uses this require statement. If you remember in my code pre previously, you saw that require statement here not there, here, which sort of includes these libraries. If you have just require with a word, no dot slash in front of it, that's requiring it directly from the node package manager, which I'll talk about in a second. And it's assigning it to that underscore variable. If we do require with the dot slash first, that means we're actually requiring a local file. So that will require model.js next to the file that it's in. So that allows you to sort of separate your code into multiple files for easy uh, separation concerns sort of there. And finally, in that model.js file, we can use this module.exports to tell it what actually to get when that require function is called. So back in my code, if we go to this test.js file and not look at this code, look at the code below it, we can see we've got module.exports and then this sort of uh, object that exports these three properties of it. And when I export those three properties, we can then access them after it's required. So we've got require.test, require the local file, and then we can say t.test2 to access the test2 property of t, which is the same property right here. So it allows you to bundle those things together. When it's bundled properly, um, I'll run browser find this file to show you how it looks after it's bundled. We can see it looks a little crazy. There's some extra function stuff in here that is what browserifies magic to connect things together simply. But overall, it's the same sort of stuff, um, and I'll go into some of the details here in a second. But it basically requires these things together and bundles it all into one file for us. Um, one thing I mentioned was including packages from Node Package Manager. Node Package Manager is part is included with Node when you install Node. Node is the sort of local JavaScript, non-browser JavaScript that you can install on your local machine for running all these tools. So if you're running these tools, you'll have NPM already set up, but NPM can also install libraries for your actual development instead of just for tools. So let's say we want to use Lodash in our local, in our uh, project, in our code on the browser. We can use NPM to install it into our project, which installs it into the node modules folder in that project. And then we can use that same require statement like we were up ahead, except instead of underscore, you do use Lodash there, and you'd get that underscore variable with the um, Lodash library properly it will all just be automatically included there. It's very simple. It includes external libraries. You, you can, um, when you include that save dev, it actually saves it to your package.json file, which allows anyone else to install these same packages and also allows for like maintaining proper versions between them. It's real cool, and it's also, it's, it, once you actually get to using it, just having all these libraries at your fingertips ought to be included super easy without having to worry about WP and Q require statements and having a million uh, scripts being um, installed on your browser at once and all that stuff. It's, it's real nice. And also, that having those required statements means uh, sort of ensures that if you're using a concat, you can have issues with when code's running in the order it's included. Well, this is sort of like you know exactly where that file is included, and it also doesn't include the global namespace because instead of having all these global variables from included libraries, you have them all just in those required statements. 
There are also things called transforms for Browserify. Browserify sort of lets you run transforms which modify how it behaves. It can modify how files are required. It can modify what sort of files are allowed to be required. You can do things like you can require SAS files into your JavaScript, which will let you just have this one larger JavaScript file that then expands out to include all the SAS that is properly rendered into CSS. You can have JavaScript templates, which you just do require the template and then run that template as a function to output the proper text. Um, one transform I use regularly with WordPress is called uh, Browserify Shim. So WordPress has a lot of built-in libraries. It has things like jQuery and Backbone, which while you might think it would be okay to bundle and just have in your one file, if you do that, a lot of other plugins are also using these core libraries. So you, you might end up having to download them twice on it. If uh, you bundle it, so that's one download, and then another plugin requires it, so that's another download. So ideally, uh, you want, um, Ideally, you want to have them only use that one that's bundled with core. So what, what Browserify Shim allows you to do is to tell Browserify, hey, don't include this package. Access it by a global variable. So over in my package.json file, I actually have a little statement here that says, hey, if anything requires jQuery, instead of packaging the whole jQuery library into my bundle for the browser, I want you to use the global jQuery variable. So then I can just have my script require jQuery and the in queue in WordPress, and then it will make sure it accesses that. And what that looks like actually in the compiled file, we can see right here. We can say, it basically says, if it's a window, get the window jQuery property. Otherwise, if there's glo the global variable is available to us, which is sort of a node thing, then we can get the global jQuery there. It shims in jQuery so we don't have to include it in the actual package. Well, with Lodash here, it's including the whole package down below in all this code. Um, so that's sort of the best way to combine Browserify with WordPress there so that we don't have redundancy in our code. The final tool I'm going to talk about is Babel, which is sort of a crazy little tool that compiles JavaScript from one form into another. Uh, the most popular use case of it is compiling what's known as uh, ES2015, or you might have also heard it be called ES6, into ES5, or the JavaScript that most browsers can read. Um, so. ES2015 is sort of like the next revision of JavaScript. If you remember like CSS3 when things were getting new rules there, sort of like a standard that's been agreed upon that of new features that are coming to JavaScript that most browsers still haven't really fully implemented. Some of these features some browsers have implemented, but no browsers have implemented all of them. What Babel allows us to do is sort of use these features now and then have them compiled into code that all browsers can read. So some new features we get in ES6 are things like, at the top there, we've got arrow functions, which are sort of like a function shorthand. The special things they allow are, if you know functions normally, the this variable inside a function refers to the function object itself. In arrow functions, that this variable actually refer, uh, is maintained with the outside scope. So it doesn't have its own this, which is useful in a lot of cases instead of having to use dot bind uh, for maintaining the list. It also does a little trickery where if you only have a single statement in your arrow function, it actually returns that the result of that first statement. So this x comma y arrow x plus y will return the sum of x and y without any return statement necessary. So it's a nice little shorthand. It works well for uh, passing and callbacks that are really small. Um, other things, the next two lines are let and const. Those are two new variable declaration types. Let is a more local variable. Normally with a var, the, it's only local to the the function it's within. It's not local to an if statement. It's not local to just a block of curly braces. But let make sure it's a, a truly local variable. It's sort of like, really, when you're using ES2015 or ES6, you can pretty much replace all your bare statements with lets, because that'll make sure your code is a little more contained within each block, and not so much like having all your variables in the function up at the top. You can have all your variables for an if statement and stuff like that. Constants sort of a variable that never changes. You assign it once, it doesn't change after that, which is useful for just sort of establishing a set thing that will cause issues if you, if you ever reassign it. Below that, we've got template strings, which are a nice way of having custom template output in a nicely formatted thing that really hasn't been out available in JavaScript before. You've had to do like string concatenation or use an external library for that, which is nice. Um, we, this one below is a little more complicated. It's called variable destructuring. So we've got an array on the right and then two new variables on the left. And so basically, we're breaking that array up into variables we can then access. So variables C and D get assigned to the first and second uh, 
item there. So C is equal to three, D is equal to four. It's easily breaking those things out. And you can use, use this for things like having multi -vari multiple variables exported from a function simply, all stuff like that. Um, the one below is a little more complex, the for of statement. If you know for in in JavaScript, which is sort of like the previous for each if you, from PHP, for in is nasty. It can cause a lot of issues that you don't expect. For of is sort of a more clean, more restricted for in. Um, it works with iterable objects, which are even objects you can define yourself, to cleanly sort of loop through them without having to worry about has own property and all the sort of pitfalls you can run into there. I can't really go into the details of why you don't want to use for in, but look it up. It's, it can be a little gross. Um, also, there are a ton more features than this. There are things like classes and all sorts more stuff. You can look it up. Babel has a big list of them with good descriptions on all of them. Um, there's some really cool stuff. And I feel like I even have it sort of just scratched the surface of what you can do here. Um, Babel also can compile JSX, which we'll probably hear about a little more later today as we go into React stuff. JSX is sort of a custom format for React that makes the templating and objects of React much simpler to create and read through. And before I continue, I'm just going to go through a quick little demonstration of how that uh, Babel works. So if you remember before, I was commenting out some things because I actually have the ES6 version of these things. Um, so up here we can see instead of that module exports, I'm using this export, which is actually the ES2015 real version of modules in JavaScript. So this is coming. It's cool, and we're going to have it. It's great for HTTP2, but while we don't have that full setup yet, we can use uh, Babel and Browserify together to still combine them in modules but use, the new, uh, use this new syntax. So here I'm going to do the same thing. So up above, we in that previous file, we had the export. In this file, we have the import. So export is sort of like that. You export, and you give it variables or functions with names, and you can access those on the other side then. On the import side, I can do like import underscore from Lodash, and that will then Babel will convert that to a require statement like below, and then Browserify will include the Lodash library in there where we need it. This is a little bit of a special use of the import where we can import specific variables, not the whole package from a separate package, which is a nice way of sort of not getting crazy heavy libraries all at once. So I can import just test2 and test3 from that uh, test.js file and ignore test1. And I can even reassign the name of test3 to just test there. Um, same thing with this jQuery statement. So when I've converted that now, I can save these files, run, I'm actually running Babel here as a transform to Browserify, so I don't even have to run an extra command. I just run uh, Browserify, and it automatically transforms it. So I'm going to run Grunt Browserify again. It bundles it, and we can see back in here in that compiled file, it's going to look a little crazier because we've got all the Babel transforms going on here. But we can see there's still those require statements. It's, sort of, we've, it's all working now for us. It's all um, there. And we can even see we've got an arrow function here working properly. If I actually run that test file, so if I run node dot slash assets js, no. something happened. Um, so there was an issue there, but generally that would be outputting the right thing. Sorry about that. So we've got the arrow function that gets converted properly into a real function, which I will show you up here. So test3 exports this function here, just like we're defining it here, but it's much shorter when it's actually compiled by Babel. So finally, let's talk about tying everything together. Um, that link there is actually to a generator I've created. If you saw uh, Mark Jacobs talk yesterday at the end of the day, he was talking about a grunt init generator. This is a yeoman generator. It's very similar. It includes this whole JavaScript workflow in it. So if you want to start working on it with your own project, you can generate it right up and play around with it. Um, I've got a grunt file in here, which I can show you briefly, which has an ESLint task, it has a Browserify task, and in that Browserify task, I've got both that Browserify shim transform and the Babelify, which is the Babel for Browserify um, transform, which allows me to run all these things at the same time. So then if I run something like grunt scripts, it does all three things at once. And I can even run a watch task. So anytime I update a JavaScript task, it automatically does all these things. It will warn me if there's any issues with the code I just saved. It will compile it properly. And then Uglify is another thing that I'm not going over right now, but it basically minifies any JavaScript you have going on there. 
Um, so that sort of gives you the full process, real fast, automatic, and easy to do with you. And especially if you use that uh, generator, it's sort of just like you set it up with JavaScript and it works. You just write your code. You write your code with ES6 if you want to. You don't have to. You write your code with as many modules and as many requires from Node Package Manager. And it's sort of magic. It just sort of works. It's nice. Um, and you know, if you if you're familiar with the Node ecosystem and with development tools like this, there's a lot of stuff going on. It's constantly changed. There are always new tools. Like if you see me talking about Grunt here, you probably are like, oh, but there's also Gulp out there, or there's also Broccoli, or there's you see me talking about Browserify. There's like Webpack, and there's JSPM. If you at ESLint, there's also JSLint. There are a thousand tools out there, and. And there are good use cases for each of them, and each has their strengths, so it's often worth it to at least do a little research to see what's out there. These are the ones I've sort of rested upon, partially from just getting to them first, and partially from seeing other people's recommendations. So it's always good to sort of keep your eyes and ears open with this stuff, because there's always new cool things being made out there. And also, you can be making new cool things if you have an idea of doing these things better than how these have been done. It's all JavaScript, so if you know JavaScript, you can write these tools. It's all just no JavaScript. Um, so that's those tools. Um, does anyone have any questions on it? Yeah. Yeah, so back there I am still importing it, and all that does in the main.js file, I'm importing dollar sign from jQuery, which basically gives me the dollar sign variable assigned to the jQuery library. And then in the actual compiled file, what happens is we get um, the jQuery global variable set to that. So still when we're in queuing the script in WordPress, we'll, we'll set jQuery as one of its dependencies. So it uses that global jQuery object in case any other plugins are also using it. I try to make sure that we have well-established tasks. So in Grunt files, you can sort of, you have the specific um, like uh, tasks that are running there, but you can also have sort of groups of tasks together. So I make sure that anything that has to do with JavaScript, I include in the scripts tag. So anytime I run the scripts, it just does all my JavaScript compilation. I also have that set up with my watch task. So up above, when I, I sort of look for any change to a JavaScript file in the assets folder, anytime that changes, run that scripts task and do all the compilation there. So it's sort of, there's still like a little knowledge about how it works there, but really if you just run, run the watch whenever you're changing things, it should always keep things properly managed there. And as long as you have things properly set up with the package.json file, the, all they have to do is run npm install and they have everything installed properly. Anything else? Yeah. No, I want to give it a try. I, I've been like, Using BrowserFi and sort of invested in it at, before I like seen Webpack. It seems cool. I think it's some of it seems more intimidating because there's sort of more built into it. But I think there's still power in that. It's, uh, some of the stuff I've seen it do it seems very interesting. Like it sort of can have multiple files being exported at once rather than a single file like BrowserFi. So if you want to only include partial ex modules for not including everything on every page, that's a cool feature. But I think I'd have to dive deeper into it to fully understand. It. I don't. I. I get nervous about tools that I don't understand exactly how they work, so I want to make sure I like fully get it before I can really dive in. I I've definitely looked at that and I'm intrigued by it. I I definitely see the bloat that's inherent in using Gulp and Grunt, and it appeals to me to run that because I can see that yes, Grunt is sort of slow. Gulp just still requires a good amount of configuration. Um, and just writing those scripts in the CLI, I, I love the CLI, so if I can just get that running, that's great. I think having the watch task is still a little clunky with that, but I'm, I've looked at maybe transitioning towards that too.
it depends on how many libraries and things you're including. Um, I would say probably like with this grunt setup, it never goes over more like three more than like three seconds or so. Yeah, if you're having like a lot of really big libraries, it can take longer because then like it's including some big files, and then also like Uglify has to can't has to like uh, compress down these huge libraries. But generally, it's never like crazy, and you can keep programming while it's compiling, so it's not a huge deal. Anything else? Uh, if not, um, I'm going to be around. You can always talk to me. I'm, I like to talk about this stuff. Thank you.